morning. You all know that I'm Gwen Mayer, the archivist at the Hudson Library and Historical Society, and it's our wonderful pleasure to host former speaker John Boehner. He also happens to be an Ohioan, guys. So three cheers for Ohio. We sent some, that's our second speaker that we ever sent to the United States House of Representatives. So John, welcome. And do you have any introductory thoughts? Well, Gwen, uh, good evening and thank you for uh, hosting this. And a big thank you to uh, uh, the uh, Hudson uh, Library and Historical Society for putting all this together. And for all of you uh, who've clicked in, uh, welcome. Uh, I think uh, we're going to have an hour and we're going to have an awful lot of fun over this next hour. Uh, listen, I'm sure a lot of you don't know a whole lot about me, but I was born in Cincinnati. I have 11 brothers and sisters. My dad owned a bar. Um, everything I needed, uh, all the lessons I needed, I should say, uh, to become Speaker of the House, I learned growing up. You've got, I'm um, the second oldest of 12. You grew up in a big family. have to learn to get along with each other, get things done together. Uh, grew up in a bar on my floors, did dishes, waited tables, tended bar. And uh, you learned a couple lessons. One is you learn the art of being able to disagree without being disagreeable. You know, that drunk's going to be sitting at the end of the bar all night. You don't want to fight with this guy, but you sure as hell don't agree with him. The second lesson you learn is you have to learn to deal with every jackass that walks in the door. Trust me, when I became speaker, all these lessons were very helpful to me. Uh, but listen, I never thought my wildest dreams I'd ever be involved in politics. Uh, you know, like a lot of you, I found a way to work myself. I went to Muller High School in Cincinnati. My high school football coach, Jerry Faust, lives in Akron. Coached at Akron, uh, and uh, and still uh, a very good friend. Uh, but I uh, worked my well myself through Xavier University, and along the way, I find myself in the packaging and plastics business. Uh, all I ever wanted to do was be a salesman, and I ended up owning a sales and marketing company. And uh, uh, the company did very well. And along the way, I got involved in my neighborhood homeowners association. Next thing you know, I'm speaker of the house. How in the world does this ever happen? Uh, you know, I, listen, I be, uh, became president of our homeowners group, thought we ought to get more involved in our growing community just north of Cincinnati. And uh, next thing you know, I'm running for township trustee. I get elected, uh, served for three years. Then I went, spent six years in the Ohio State House. You know, it's hard to get elected when your people can't say your name. You know, my name looks like Beaner, Bonner, Boner. And uh, I find myself in a race for Congress against a guy named Tom Kindness. Yes, Boner versus Kindness. Now, I learned a real lesson there. Uh, elections aren't decided what, based on what the polls say. They're decided based on who shows up to vote. It was a Republican primary in 1990, and, and uh, I turned my voters out and, uh, and, and won the election, even though there was no poll uh, show me within 50 points of having any chance of winning. Uh, but uh, I went on to serve for 25 years in the United States Congress. I uh, heavily involved in reforming the Congress in my early years, a rail rabble rouser. Uh, I was Newt Gingrich's uh, chief lieutenant uh, for a while. Uh, and then Gingrich left. They threw me out of the leadership. I started all over. Uh, but I spent five years as the chairman of the Education and Workforce Committee in the Congress, uh, one of the most meaningful jobs I had uh, during my 25 years there. I uh, got to work with a guy named Ted Kennedy. And uh, while Ted Kennedy and I were described as political bookends, uh, Ted Kennedy was a great legislator uh, who liked to legislate, wanted to get things done. Uh, and he and I developed a very close relationship and frankly did an awful lot of work, including uh, passing No Child Left Behind. Uh, but uh, uh, in 2006, I uh, became the majority leader uh, after Tom DeLay stepped down. We lost the majority in 2006, and I became the minority leader. And so, uh, you know, from 07, 8, 9, 10, I was the minority leader. Uh, Barack Obama got elected in 2008. And then in 2010, uh, we had this giant Republican class uh, that elected me speaker. Spent five years as uh, the Speaker of the House. And uh, it was really, uh, it was a great experience. Uh, for a kid who grew up in a little house with two bedrooms, uh, it, it's really kind of remarkable. And the reason I wrote the book is I thought I had a pretty interesting life. I had a very interesting career. And, uh, and I thought I could tell a pretty interesting story. And so, uh, you know, 
And these days, I'm a senior strategic advisor with Squire Patton Boggs, uh, international law firm, frankly, with its origins in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, I also serve on several corporate boards and corporate advisory boards. Uh, but it gives me a little something to do, but not too much. Uh, so I spend about half of my life in Marco Island, Florida, where I am tonight. Uh, the other half, uh, just north of Cincinnati and Westchester, Ohio. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to the, the discussion tonight, looking forward to your questions, and uh, having a little fun along the way. Uh, by the way, I've got a glass of wine with me, and I'm going to have this, my first glass tonight, uh, while we do this broadcast. So with that, Gwen, fire away. Well, I'm glad you're having a glass of wine. First, we should mention the whole reason you're here is that book. It's called On the House. And I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but today it was the number one nonfiction book on the New York Times uh, bestsellers list. So how does it feel to be a number one book on the New York Times bestsellers list? And how's the book tour going? Well, the book tour, uh, this, is, uh, this is kind of the end of the book tour. I've been at this now for about two and a half weeks. I've probably done 40 interviews. And uh, uh, most of them have gone well, all of them have gone well, but dealing with those big uh, network people, uh, you know, they want to talk about everything other than the book. Uh, but uh, listen, for me to be at the top of the New York Times bestseller list, <laughs> I, I just chuckle. Uh, who, me? I don't write books. Uh, but, uh, but I know how to tell stories. And that's what uh, my book is really all about. It's kind of about my story uh, told in my way. And uh, for those... Uh, Friends of mine who have read it, uh, they'll say, Vayner, it sounds just like you. Uh, but uh, I'm honored uh, that I'm at the top of the New York Times bestseller list, and I hope you'll keep buying the book. I have to say, I read your book. I loved it. And I am a non-golfer. So a question from a non-golfer in Northeast Ohio. What's your favorite course in Northern Ohio? Well, I play a lot of golf at, uh, at Firestone Country Club in Akron. Uh, where I had an event every year, and uh, and loved the place. And for those who may frequent Firestone Country Club, uh, you'll know about the 19th hole, which is the the bar there. There's a guy named Fuzzy who's the bartender, uh, who's an absolute piece of work. And so, uh, for those of you that know Fuzzy, uh, tell the old guy I said hi. The book is really a, a great deal of your view of life through golf and politics. Would you not agree? Yeah, you know, I spent a lot of uh, spent a, my, a lot of my life playing golf and spent a lot of my life uh, in politics. I was in elected office for 34 years. And so, uh, uh, and, and, and golf was my escape from all the craziness. And so I played a lot of golf just to get away from all the political stuff. And so it's, it was natural for me uh, to, uh, uh, to tell my story uh, around the two things that I spent most of my life doing, politics and golf. So tell us about your golfing with presidents. <laughs> well, uh, the first thing is, is that I realized when I was putting this book together uh, that I had met 10 presidents. And I, even when I say it, I start chuckling. I mean, how could I, uh, this, you know, this little kid growing up in Cincinnati, uh, go on to meet uh, 10 presidents? Uh, but I played golf with, uh, no, I don't know, six or seven of them. And uh, uh, there's stories about all of them. I can tell you stories. There's stories in a book about playing with George W. Bush, uh, about playing with Barack Obama, Donald Trump. Uh, but there's a really, really good story about playing golf with Gerald Ford. Uh, Jerry, there's a chapter in my book entitled Jerry and Jerry. Jerry with a J and Jerry with a G. And uh, the chapter is about Jerry Faust and Jerry Ford, uh, two of my heroes. When I did the audio uh, version of my book, I recorded it. I didn't want to, but all my friends and, and uh, staff, former staff, said, you've got to record the audio version of your book. Well, uh, you know, when you record the audio version, you have to enunciate every word. Uh, you don't want it to sound like uh, you're reading something. So you, you want to sound like you're having a conversation with the listener. And then uh, some of this book, uh, you know, can get kind of emotional. Uh, you know, for those of you who don't know me much, I can turn to tears pretty quickly. And uh, this chapter, I never thought I'd get through it. Uh, talking about my two buddies, Jerry Faust and Jerry Ford. Uh, but uh, uh, they really were 
uh, two of my heroes and two uh, really good guys. But uh, playing golf with presidents, uh, you know, they're like anybody else. Once they tee that ball up, they're just like any other golfer you play with uh, because any pretense of what they were or might have been all goes out the window when they start playing golf. We have a question right off the bat. How did your wife feel when you entered politics? Well, she uh, she had no idea what I was getting into, and neither did I. Uh, I remember uh, my first race in 1981 for township trustee. I said, uh, Deb, we've got to do a, a family photo. Our girls were three and one. And then um, we went to this... Uh, uh, this farm, quote, studio, and uh, took a great photo. It was, in, it was in a lot of brochures in the early part of my career. Uh, but uh, she and the kids were very supportive of, uh, of my political efforts all those years, in spite of the fact that, uh, you know, they got teased, they got harassed at school, and, uh, and you know, God knows uh, how many people ended up in jail because they called the house threatening my wife or threatening me. Uh, it was uh, tough duty. When you entered um, Congress, you were defined in some ways as a rebel. And you were very much um, out to fix some problems that you saw there. Can you just very briefly address what they were? Well, when I got to Congress, uh, uh, you know, we filled out all the forms. It's like any new job. And uh, there was this form. Uh, to become a member of the House Bank. I didn't need another bank account. I had plenty of bank accounts. I wanted them to wire my pay to Ohio. And I got this big fight with them. Uh, and they made it clear, you're not going to get paid unless you have an account at the House Bank. So finally, uh, I gave up and uh, I had an account at the House Bank. I wasn't happy about it, but, uh, be that as it may. Well, about nine months later, I'm reading USA Today. I don't know, page six or seven, bottom left-hand corner is this little box. And in there, it said that members of Congress uh, had bounced uh, 8,226 checks in 1990 at the House Bank, according to the annual audit of the General Accounting Office. And I thought, that's a little weird. You know, there's only 435 of us. Uh, what the hell's going on over there? So I start asking questions. Well, people would just kind of turn white. And I grew up in a bar. You know, I can smell BS a mile away. And uh, and finally, nobody would say anything. Nobody would tell us anything. So we brought our probate resolution to the floor of the House. I and a couple of my freshman Republican colleagues. Now, listen, Republicans in Congress at the time were in the minority of the minority. And, uh, you know, Tom Foley, the Speaker, came to the well of the House. Dick Kephart, the majority leader, came to the well. Even the Republican leader came to the well. And all three of them essentially said the same thing. We didn't do anything wrong, and we won't do it again. Well, I was outraged. And uh, so I gathered up six of my fellow freshman Republicans, and we went on a campaign to close the House Bank. Four days later, it was closed. Uh, and then through this, they tried to blame it on, they shoved it all off the ethics committee, tried to blame it on a handful of members, but as it turns out, like 350 members had bounced checks. And then through all this, uh, the phone kept ringing. Problems in the house dining room where members weren't paying their bill. Uh, the house post office scandal. Uh, members were cashing in stamps for cash. And you could even buy cocaine at the house post office. So early in my career, uh, I became a reformer. I didn't know. I didn't go there to be a reformer, but these problems were staring us right in the face. And I was hell bent on getting them cleaned up. Uh, and none of my colleagues, Democrat or Republican, much cared for me or my colleagues. There are people out in the world today that are trying to defend the Constitution from changes being made to it. Um, might you educate a few of us and tell us who was the last group of people to initiate a change to the Constitution? Well, uh, I was involved in an effort uh, uh, some years ago. Uh, that started in September of 1789. Everybody knows about the Bill of Rights, uh, the first uh, 10 changes uh, to uh, uh, to the Constitution. 
But there were actually 12 proposed changes in September of 1789. Uh, one of them that did not make the Big Ten, uh, the Bill of Rights, uh, was an amendment to the Constitution that said, uh, if you vote for a pay raise, you're not entitled to receive the pay raise as a member of Congress until after the next succeeding election. In other words, you can't give yourself a pay raise uh, without standing in front of the voters first. And uh, this has languished uh, uh, around uh, the states uh, since 1789. Ohio adopted this in the mid, mid to late 1800s. Uh, but there were three or four states. That's all we needed to get to 38 states uh, to ratify uh, this amendment. And so I worked with state legislators in, uh, in about a half a dozen states. And all of a sudden, uh, we now have 27 amendments to the Constitution. And the 27th Amendment says... Uh, that Congress can't give itself a pay raise uh, during the current term that they're in Congress. Thank you. Um, let's talk about your Bainerisms. You have these wonderful sayings about life in general. Could you outline <laughs> just a couple of them for us? Well, over the years, uh, my staff heard me say these, these things over and over. And uh, so uh, they start calling them Bainerisms. And then somebody, I didn't realize this until I retired, made an actual official list of Bainerisms. Uh, I think uh, the first, uh, there, there's, there's no particular order, but uh, the first one in my mind is it doesn't cost anything to be nice. I mean, it doesn't cost anything. You know, we're, we're blessed. We're from the Midwest. All right, we, we, we grew up with a set of values uh, that are quite different than what you'd see on either coast. And, uh, you know, people in the Midwest are nice. And anyway, so I've started saying it doesn't cost anything to be nice. It doesn't. Uh, secondly, uh, I mentioned this earlier, uh, you can disagree without being disagreeable. You know, Nancy Pelosi and I, or Barack Obama and I, we didn't agree on a whole lot. Uh, but I had a nice relationship with both of them. Uh, it was never about them. It was about the policy differences. And, uh, and I never made it personal because... It would make it too difficult to get things done. Um, what my parents taught me, I taught my kids. I try to teach my colleagues. If you do the right things for the right reasons, the right things will probably happen. Just don't worry about it. You know, our members would worry about voting yes or voting no, and somebody's going to get mad. And I said, listen, whether you vote yes or no, somebody's going to be upset. So you must well do the right thing. Uh, it was... Uh, I know it sounds simple, but every day, every day, I just try to do the right thing. <laughs> I, whether it was the Republican thing or the Democrat thing, it didn't matter. Uh, if I thought it was the right thing to do, I was going to do it. And uh, you know what? It all worked out pretty well. There's a whole host of other ones. Nothing rolls like a ball. You got the list in front of you. I don't, but I got other really good ones in there. I like really the good. one about the skunk. <laughs> what about the skunk? Um, other questions that we have for you. What's your perspective on redrawing congressional districts? Well, you know, from the 1930s to the to 1990, uh, Democrats had the pencil in a majority of the states. Around 1990, Republicans started to, uh, uh, to get their grip on the pencil. And by 2010, we had a pretty good grip on the pencil. And so we've been drawing the lines the last 30 years in the majority of states. Now, you know, Democrats don't like this, so they can't win state legislative seats. So what they want to do, they want to change the rules. Well, guess what? Turnabout is fair play. Some human being or some group of human beings are going to draw these lines. I've seen these so-called nonpartisan commissions. There's one in California dominated by Democrats. The districts are drawn for Democrats. Uh, Republicans have no prayer. The nonpartisan commission. Uh, it's all nonsense. Uh, we ought to, in Ohio, the, the, the Constitution says the legislature, uh, or the apportionment board, actually, which is made up of primarily the legislature uh, and the administration, draw the lines. And so, uh, you know, it is what it is. Uh, the states have changed it lately. Uh, there have been a couple of efforts in Ohio to put this on the ballot and uh, and to change the state constitution. Uh, but uh, until that happens, 
the legislature is going to draw the lines. Talk to me about January 6th. Do you think that we need a commission to look into what happened to that day? And if we do, are you willing to serve on that commission? Uh, no, I'm not going to serve on any commission. Uh, but I do think uh, I do think there needs to be a commission. Uh, I've been a little surprised that uh, Speaker Pelosi uh, hasn't sat down with uh, uh, the minority leader, Kevin McCarthy, and come to an agreement on what this commission would look like and how it would operate. Uh, there's nothing partisan about 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 this. There should not be anything partisan about this investigation. And uh, you know, her first proposal and current proposal uh, is uh, you know has a partisan makeup to it, uh, which uh, I've seen all the every kind of commission known to man. And if it's a partisan makeup, you're going to get a partisan outcome, and nobody's going to learn anything. Uh, if you get a bipartisan commission to look at this, and uh, you gonna the, the forces that bring them together and push them apart uh, will give you a report that people can believe in. And so uh, uh, I, I, I'm hopeful that they'll do it. Brad wants to know about your favorite memory on the Truman balcony during Merlot and cigarette negotiations. Well, the Truman balcony is on the uh, second floor of the White House. Uh, and uh, uh, and it wasn't about budget negotiations. I was up there one night uh, having dinner with President uh, Bush and his wife. My wife happened to be in town. There were a couple other members there. And, uh, and the president said, come on, Boner. That's what he would call me. Come on, Boner. Uh, we're going out. Uh, we're going out on the balcony. And he was smoking some little cigars at the time. Uh, I smoked my cigarettes, but we sat out there for about an hour. It, this balcony looked right over the eclipse and right at the Washington Monument with the Jefferson Memorial right behind it. And he and I sat there for an hour one night. It was just the, it was a delightful, uh, delightful conversation with one of my dearest friends. Now, uh, I've uh, budget negotiations. I was sat, sat on, outside of the Oval Office. On, uh, on a patio that Ronald Reagan had built back in the 80s. This is July the 3rd, uh, 2011. Uh, I was the new speaker, been speaker for about seven months, six months, and uh, Barack Obama was president. And I just gotten back in town. He just gotten back in town. I'm buying 15 high school buddies of mine and their spouses in town uh, for dinner. And, uh, but uh, President Obama really wanted to meet, so I snuck, I uh, had my security guys take me down to the White House. We, you have to kind of sneak in the White House without alerting the press. And so we had a couple of avenues, uh, ways we could get into the White House without the press knowing it. And the President and I were in the Oval Office, and uh, he wanted to have this conversation. You know, it was about six o'clock at night, and uh, I really didn't want to sit in the Oval Office. I said, hey, boss. Why don't we go outside and sit on that, uh, outside on the patio here? Yeah, sure, sure. So, President uh, Obama and I go outside. It's got to be 95 degrees, 95% humidity, uh, but I can smoke. So, uh, here I am. Uh, at one point, I look up. I notice I'm drinking a glass of uh, Merlot and smoking a cigarette. And I look over across the table, and here's the President of the United States, Barack Obama, chomping on Nicorette and drinking iced tea. What else do you need to know about the two of us? <laughs> Caitlin wants to know how you feel about abolishing the Electoral College. Well, first thing I guess it's not going to happen, so it doesn't matter what I think, although I will tell you in a moment what I think. Well, you'd have to change the Constitution to do that. That means you need a two-thirds vote in the House, a two-thirds vote in the Senate, and 38 states would have to ratify. Now, the reason we have uh, the Electoral College is that it protects the now the middle of the country. When they were putting the Constitution together, everybody's worried about New York. New York and, uh, and uh, I don't know, Massachusetts, I think it was, uh, the two big states at the time. And, uh, and so uh, they came up with the Electoral College to protect uh, everyone's interest, they thought. Well, now if you look at what's going on, you know, you've got uh, the blue states are, are 
all the way on the East Coast and the West Coast. And, uh, and these are some big states where somebody could run up the vote, New York, run up the vote in California, and wipe out the votes of all those people in the middle of the country, the flyover territory, like Ohio. And, uh, and so uh, uh, the Electoral College has been good for our country. It's still good for our country. Uh, and I know some people don't like it, but get over it because it didn't go all the way. Joe wants to know how we get more willing bipartisanship back among the members of Congress. Well, members and the leaders are being held hostage by the loudest voices in their districts. Uh, I watched it happen when I was there, but it's a lot worse now than it was then. And, uh, and what I mean by that is that uh, members, members reflect the views of their constituents or I should say more correctly, uh, the loudest constituents they have, because those are the ones you, you hear from. And so uh, uh, if, if uh, as an example, if Mitch McConnell uh, were to sit down with uh, President Biden and cut some deal on something, I don't know, pick up pick a infrastructure, the right would go crazy, the left would go crazy, uh, and uh, probably never become law. It's, uh, it's, uh, it gives you an example of how divided America's politics are today. It's a mess. Uh, it was bad enough when I was there, but it's gotten a whole lot worse. Uh, but, you know, uh, I did more bipartisan deals with President Obama, Nancy Pelosi, Harry Reid, Ted Kennedy, uh, because uh, I, I would tell them, let's stay focused on the issue. Not about what this group thinks or that group thinks, what the right thinks or left thinks. Let's stay focused on, in my case, with Kennedy, what's in the best interest of America's kids in school? What about kids that have disabilities? If we focus on the kids, we'll, we'll be able to come to an agreement. But if we start focusing in on groups, and then this group and that group, uh, we'll, we'll never get there. And so if they would stay focused on the issues, uh, they have a better chance of, of finding common ground. We have a question about the polarization breaking point. Um, do you think that the concerns about that are founded, or is this just another swing of the pendulum? Uh, the pendulum's still swinging, still swinging in the wrong direction. Uh, listen, uh, I'm a big believer in America. Uh, we're the most resilient people that God ever put on earth. And, uh, you know, I remember... Uh, uh, reading about Winston Churchill, 1940, before the U.S. Uh, got into World War II. Uh, Churchill uh, was about to lose England. He's on the floor of the commons, beating the hell out of, uh, out of America. Those Americans, they'll make every mistake known to man. They'll do it wrong and wrong and wrong until they get it right. Uh, we always figure it out. Uh, sometimes later than we should, not as quick as we should. <clears throat> But we always figure it out. At some point, America is going to look up and say, wait a minute. We're tired of all this bickering. We're tired of this gridlock. We expect you all to get something accomplished. And guess what? If America starts saying that, you'll see members working together. Jim wants to know what you have to say about earmarks. Uh, listen, in and of themselves, they're not awful. Uh, I never asked for one. Uh, one of my con potential constituents when I was first running for Congress, they asked me about earmarks. I looked him in the eye and said, listen, if you think my job is to go to Washington and rob the public treasury on your behalf, you're voting for the wrong guy. I said it, I meant it, so I don't do earmarks. Never did one. Actually, uh, I did everything I could to get rid of them. Uh, because what I noticed over the years uh, is uh, how they were used to corrupt the legislative process. People buying votes, basically, uh, with a promise of earmarks. Uh, then I noticed all the leaders were getting most of the money, and all the chairmen. And so, uh, and then we had members putting earmarks in bills and getting paid off, the corrupt people who actually went to jail. So when I became speaker, there were no more earmarks. And we've not had any earmarks for the last 10 years, 11 years. Uh, listen, uh, uh, they're trying to bring them back. Uh, if there's enough transparency, 
enough accountability, maybe it'll work. Uh, but mark my words, it won't be long before there will be a grotesque example uh, of federal funds going into somebody's pocket or some really silly project. It's just a matter of time. Lee wants to know what the hardest part of writing your book was. Actually, I think it was uh, the organization of it. You know, all the things that are in the book, things that I said, and uh, uh, trying to recall things, trying to recall the right things. You know, I don't want to put everything in the book. Uh, and so, you, you know, you got to edit things out that may I mean, maybe nice, but didn't quite fit the book. Uh, but uh, the organizing of all the material, uh, I had some help doing that. And, uh, and that was really the hardest part putting it in uh, what I would call a readable, interesting fashion. An avid reader wants to know about your trips, public trips, Codels, um, and there's a funny story about you and Uber. <laughs> well, listen, I, uh, uh, I enjoy traveling. Uh, when I was uh, in Congress, uh, at least uh, the, last, uh, the, fifth, the last 15 years I was in Congress, I visited every state. Uh, I don't want to say every congressional district, but most of them. I would go help members raise money, Republican members, to raise money, raise money for the party. And if I wasn't in D.C., I was traveling I, I, nonstop. Every August, I was on a motor coach uh, for about, uh, well, 22, 23 years. Every August, I'd be on a motor coach. Uh, we never stayed on it, but we traveled on it, district to district. Go do an event for a member, play golf, go fishing, spend the night, drive, same thing. And then, uh, and then you know, uh, being a member of Congress, uh, I wasn't a big traveler uh, when my kids were growing up. I, I just, I don't know, I, and, and nobody asked me because I was this rabble rouser. It wasn't like they wanted me to go on trips with them uh, until, uh, until we took the majority. And then I went uh, with King Rich on uh, a trip to Asia. 11-day trip was like the Bataan Death March. And I decided I was never going to do a trip uh, like that again. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've probably been in 70 or 80 countries around the world. Uh, met a lot of the world's leaders. And if you're a member of Congress, uh, you need to travel. You need to, you need to see how wide America is, how big the world is, how different the world is, how different different parts of the U.S. are. Uh, travel was, uh, was very helpful. So uh, I retired. And uh, I still had a security detail, a smaller one, but I had security detail for a few more weeks. But right after I retired, uh, right before I retired, my staff put this Uber app on my phone. And, uh, and so I thought, you know what, I'm going to do this Uber thing. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I ordered this car and, it says somebody's coming, and I'm riding with Caroline. I'm in an Uber pool. Well, I don't want Uber pool. I don't even know what it is, but I don't want to. I'm not riding with anybody. So I get rid of this car, and, and then I order another one. Well, this guy gets lost, and I never did find him. So the third time I tried this, this Uber guy must have been sitting right outside my, my apartment because, I mean, he was there. So I go down, and it's this, you know, 1994 Toyota Corolla. The guy could speak no English. And it was all gas, all break, all gas, all break. And I'm trying to tell him, I don't want Uber pool. And he makes it clear to me, listen, buddy, if I get an order to pick somebody up, I got to stop and pick him up. So here I am all the way out to Bethesda, Maryland, 45 minutes, maybe an hour, dying in the backseat that he's going to stop and pick somebody up. And they're going to wonder what the hell the Speaker of the House is doing in the backseat of this lousy car. Um, anyway, by the time I got there, I figured out what I did wrong. And so on the way home, we didn't stop and pick anybody up. There are a lot of rumors. This story has been expanded hundreds of times in DC. It's kind of a legendary story there. But uh, <laughs> by the time I got there, I figured out what I did wrong. I had no problem getting home. Laura wants to know a little bit about you when you were a young boy. How did your mother raise boys that were told not to cry or cry? How did you learn not to give a darn about what people think and when to show your emotions? And 
What's your mom? Uh, listen, there, there were so many of us that, uh, you know, we just kind of grew up. I was the second oldest of, uh, uh, of this crowd. Nine boys, three girls. Uh, my mother, uh, she ran the household. She cooked. I don't know. My dad ran the bar. And uh, uh, I, how, how it all worked, I have no idea. Uh, but uh, all I do know is that I played football, basketball, baseball. And every sport there was, I played. And one of my parents was at every one of our games. All 12 of us. One of my parents was always there. How they did that, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, playing on uh, team sports, you learn a lot about teamwork. And uh, so I was a big team guy. I had a, my, my business. Uh, I built a team. Uh, my employees and I were all one team. Uh, when I was uh, in Congress, my staff and I were a team. When I became the leader, uh, all the members in our staff were all one team. And so uh, uh, it, uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was quite an experience growing up in a, in a big family and, and not, not a very big house. Uh, someone wants to know about your opinion of the filibuster. Uh, the filibuster uh, has been in place in the Senate now for well over 100 years. Uh, when the founders put our government together, they thought the House uh, should be the hot cup of coffee. That's why we have two-year terms. It keeps us very close to our constituents. It's kind of a rebellious place. Uh, but the Senate, uh, they have six-year terms. And the Senate was envisioned to be the saucer under the hot cup of coffee. Uh, they wanted the Senate to be more deliberative. Uh, if you get rid of the filibuster, the Senate will look like the House. Uh, it'll be total chaos. And so uh, uh, this, the filibuster is not going away. I know that everybody keeps talking about it. The votes are not there to eliminate the filibuster. Uh, there are at least five or six Democrats, uh, some of whom haven't said a word yet, uh, who are adamantly opposed to get rid of the filibuster, the legislative filibuster, uh, because that's really all that's left. Harry Reid took part of the filibuster on judges away. Uh, McConnell took the rest of it away on Supreme Court judges. So, uh, but the legislative filibuster is not going anywhere. Now, both sides know there are a lot of things that have not happened that would have happened uh, had the filibuster not been there. That would have made both sides very uneasy. So, it's not going anywhere. Relax. Someone wants have to drink, know... Have a, have a, have a swig of your wine. Someone wants to know about Senator John Glenn and um, our efforts for space. They want to know what he was like as a senator and what do you think of our space program? You know, uh, I as I served uh, with John Glenn. I knew John Glenn, but I, I can't say I really know him well. Uh, the space, space program for about 40 years had a real focus. And there was a real effort and a focus uh, for the space program. But when we got into the early 2000s, uh, a lot of us were asking, All right, what's, what's the goal here? What's the plan? And NASA couldn't even tell us what the goal was. It was horrible. And so, uh, you know, NASA funding got whacked back and forth because they couldn't tell us what they were trying to accomplish. Now, I think they're starting to get their act back together and the funding is starting to come back. But uh, uh, they, they've had a real challenge. But I think what's really exciting uh, are all these private contractors uh, who are getting into the space business. Now, I think this is uh, these people have real money to spend uh, and real science to put to the test. Uh, and frankly, I think it's going to be good for the space program overall. Libby wants to know what you believe are the most important issues for us to tackle in our country today. Well, I'm a big believer in education. You know, I, I, I won't say I got the greatest education, but I had a chance at a decent education. And, uh, uh, and I don't think enough Americans have a chance at a decent education. Education is the, the equalizer in America, unlike any place else in the world. Uh, but we don't do a very good job of educating all of America's kids. Now, uh, it breaks my heart. I, I, you want to get me teared up, I can get teared up real quick over that one. 
uh, because I think every child deserves a chance at a decent education. I think we have huge infrastructure needs. Uh, you know, Biden's proposed an infrastructure bill. Uh, it kind of broadens the definition of infrastructure, but I mean, I'm talking about real infrastructure. We've got serious infrastructure needs and no way to pay for it. You know, most of our infrastructure over the last 50, 60 years was all paid for by the gasoline tax. Well, the gasoline tax revenue keeps going down because my cars are more efficient, more miles per gallon, more electric vehicles and hybrids on the road. Uh, so uh, we, we don't have a funding source, but we have huge infrastructure problems that desperately uh, need to be addressed. And we got this climate issue. You know, we've got to find some way in a bipartisan way uh, to find common ground on climate. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to, I don't want to argue with the scientists or anything else, but uh, most of the the ideas from the left will crater our economy and put a lot of people out of work. Uh, there's got to be, there's got to be some common ground on climate that will help address the issue. I know you get asked this a lot, but you want to talk about the Republican leadership and what it's going to take to get the Republican Party back to being more congenial? And how do we do it? <laughs> well, I think Republicans uh, need to start talking about what it means to be a Republican. Uh, this isn't about personalities. It's not about <laughs> rumors, theories, all kinds of nonsense. Listen, I'm a Republican. I'm a conservative Republican. I'm just not crazy. And, you know, we got some crazy people who, who frankly hijacked the Republican Party, in my view. And, uh, uh, being a Republican, in my view, means uh, fiscal responsibility. Uh, it means, uh, you know, free and fair trade. It is not rocket science. It means a strong national defense. There are things that, that bring people together as Republicans that have served our party well uh, for, you know, uh, what? Uh, 150 years, 160 years. We start talking about who we are as Republicans, what we believe in. Uh, we can get away from some of this other nonsense that that continues to haunt us. Let's talk just a wee little bit about personalities. Can you tell us about meeting Pope Francis? Oh wow, yeah. So uh, I tried for twenty years, going back to nineteen ninety five, uh, to have. Uh, a Pope address a joint session of Congress. It's like a State of the Union. Both the House and the Senate, the administration, everybody shows up. Uh, we'd never have one in the history of, of our country. And I thought it would be nice if we could get a pontiff to come and address a joint session of Congress. Well, I never heard from uh, Pope John Paul, and, and he passed away, and I was at his funeral. And uh, Pope Benedict got elevated. And uh, so I sent a letter to Pope Benedict. Uh, I didn't hear back from him. He came to Washington, but he went to the White House. I had dinner with him at the White House. And then he passed away. I was at his funeral. And, uh, and then Francis got elevated. So in uh, February of, uh, or January of 2015, well, I'd sent him a letter, sent Francis a letter. And uh, in February of 2015, Cardinal, uh, Cardinal World, the Archbishop of Washington, was going to the Vatican to see the Pope. I asked him uh, to re remind the Pope that I had sent this letter and, and asked him to lobby on my behalf. So I don't know, three or four days later, World calls me and says, no, nah, you can't tell anybody, but he's coming. He's coming. Oh, my God. So uh, my staff starts working with the Vatican, and uh, we come up with a date. He's coming on September 24th. Well, it turns out my daughter's pregnant with my first grandchild, going to be born in August, like six weeks before the Pope's coming. So Cardinal Dolan, New York, Cardinal World, D.C., uh, start working the, the Vatican over to get the Pope to baptize my grand, grandchild. Well, you have to remember now, the Vatican has a 2,000-year head start on bureaucracy over the U.S. They are very good at this. Now, finally, uh, they make it clear, listen, we We'd be happy to have the Pope bless your grandson, but we don't really want to do baptism. Fine, got it. So we get to September 24th, 2015. I've got every camera in the world in my office. 
Uh, this is, uh, it turns out to be a really big deal. Well, here I am, Catholic grade school, Catholic high school, Catholic university, older boy, and I am going to greet the Pope, shake his hand, and turn around and face the world's cameras without crying. No chance. So uh, here I am, I'm waiting for the Pope. I, I mean, I'm doing everything I can to hold myself together, which is not working real well. Uh, but I hold it together just long enough after I pick, uh, shake the Pope's hand, and we turn around, and we do this photo uh, for the press. Works out fine. Go to my office, and here's the Pope with seven cardinals. I look at my chief of staff. I said, what the hell are we doing here? Uh, so I had this nice meeting that starts to break up. And uh, my family's in this adjoining room. They start to come in. Pope and I get up. And the Pope says to his assistant, he says, uh, hey, uh, give me a glass of water. Oh, my God. He's going to bless you. He's going to baptize you. So I watch this assistant go get his glass of water, brings it back to the Pope, and the Pope takes it from him in his right hand. He transfers it to his left hand. Now, waiting for him to bless it, he just took a drink of water. It was the greatest head fake you have ever seen in your life. Uh, but the Pope and I spent uh, an entire morning together, and he did a great job with his address to Congress. Uh, we're getting ready to leave, and there's this departure ceremony, and they're holding the Pope and I back, and I look up, and it was just the Pope and me on the first floor of the Capitol. There's nobody anywhere close. And the Pope takes his left arm and grabs my left arm and pulls me next to him. And he starts saying the sweetest things that anybody's ever said to me. Well, I'm like a fire hose. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sobbing to no end. I'm still sobbing. He puts his right arm around me, gives me this giant bear hug and says, Speaker, will you pray for me? Who? Me? Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, so by the time we got outside for the departure ceremony, I look like uh, something a cat drug in. I mean, I was a mess. Uh, but uh, uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful day for the Capitol. As a matter of fact, later on that day, I re realized it was probably the happiest day uh, I saw in the 25 years I was there at the U.S. Capitol. Democrats, Republicans, House, Senate, staff, everybody uh, had a very happy day. I hate to take away those happy memories, but can you tell me about when you almost got stabbed? <laughs> so we talked earlier about earmarks. Uh, early in my career, I, I, I was held down against earmarks. And these bills would come to the floor, especially transportation bills, infrastructure bills, loaded with earmarks. So I'm down on the floor railing against these earmarks. And I come up, I get finished my speech, I'm walking toward the back of the chamber. Next thing you know, this big old guy, who's still in Congress, by the way, from Alaska, throws me up against the back wall of the chamber and puts a 10-inch knife to my throat. Now, I mean, not sharp, right here. And he's yelling at me and yelling at me and holding this knife up to my throat. And I looked at him and I said, screw you. Except it was kind of squeaky. And I probably used different words. 23 years later, same guy asked me to be his best man at his wedding. You can't make this up. You can't make it up. Somebody wants to know, who's your favorite president personally? Uh, George W. Bush. Uh, he and I are like, uh, are like two brothers, two peas out of the same pod. We understand each other inside now. Uh, I talked to him the other day. He's, uh, <laughs> he's got his own book coming out. Thinks I stepped all over his book. And he didn't think I told enough stories in my book about him kicking my rear end on a golf course. <laughs> Someone wants you to comment on party coercion. How does a party get its members to vote the way they should vote? <laughs> hey, if I ever figure that out, I'll let you know. Uh, it's not coercion. I mean, people run as Democrats because they tend to be Democrats or runs Republicans because they tend to be Republicans. Uh, but, you know, we're America's essentially a two-party country. Uh, but because we're essentially just a two-party country, unlike Europe, where you've got eight, nine, ten parties, inside the two parties, you've got big differences. And so uh, uh, trying, to, uh, trying to bring the two parties, each party together, 
Uh, it, it can be horrendous. Pelosi has done a better job of it than I did. Although there's, she's about to have the kind of problems I've had uh, between her moderate members and her far left members. You know, on any given day, I have 210, 215 Republican votes. But you need 218 to have a majority. And I'd have a couple dozen, two or three dozen knuckleheads who wanted it all their way or no way. Well, you know, great. The world doesn't work that way. Uh, but uh, they were more interested in chaos uh, than they were in governing. But uh, I woke up every morning knowing I had to play the cards I was dealt overnight. I played them as best I could and tried to bring those guys in line. But, you know, uh, you can drag a horse to the water, but you can't make him drink. John, people want to know what you read. Uh, I read, uh, I'm kind of a voracious reader. Uh, I read fiction. I read nonfiction. Uh, I'm reading uh, about uh, this uh, uh, murder that happened in Eden Park in Cincinnati. Uh, somebody told me about it the other day, and I, I downloaded I found it and downloaded it. I wish I could tell you the title of it. Uh, but uh, it was about this bootlegger, this, this famous bootlegger in the 1920s uh, who shot his wife and claimed an insanity defense. Uh, I, that's as far as I've got. <laughs> but... Uh, I read, uh, I don't know, I, I know I read at least a book a week. And, uh, uh, but I never thought I'd write a book. I really never thought I'd write a book. There was another reason. I told you why I wrote a book. Interesting story, interesting career. There's another reason. I got pretty convinced that somebody uh, was going to write a book about me at some point. And I thought to myself, you know, before whoever it is writes a book about me and says whatever, I am going to tell my side of the story. So I did. You're very unusual. There aren't that many speakers of the house that have written books. So it's a joy to be able to read from your perspective. Thank you. Um, Pam is concerned about our country and she wants you to give her hope for the future because of all the vitriol. Got any great words of wisdom here? Chill, chill. Have a glass of wine. We're, 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 we're a great country. We've got our problems. And as Winston Churchill says, you know, we'll, we'll make mistakes, make mistakes, but we'll eventually get it right. Uh, listen, I, we've got our political divisions right now, but, you know, we are the envy of the world. We have, we have, the, we have the most unique economy in the history of the world. Uh, we're this giant melting pot of people from all over the world. We allow more people to come here legally than the rest of the world put together. Immigration has been great for our country. And, uh, and, uh, and we will figure this out. I'm not, uh, trust me, I am about as bullish on America as I am on any of them. Uh, <clears throat> sit back, believe in your fellow citizens, we'll be just fine. Ed wants to know, other than a hole in one, what might you do differently if you had to do it all over again? I wouldn't change anything. There's not one thing in my life I would change. Uh, I, I, listen, I've been blessed uh, to grow up with great parents. Blessed to grow up in a little house where you had to learn to get along with people. Blessed to grow up in a bar where I've met a whole bunch of characters who, who I learned something from all of them. Blessed to have every single job known to man. You can't even believe the number of jobs I had. If I could make a buck, I did. There was not one day of my life I was unemployed until I retired uh, from Congress. And so anyway, I, I've had a great life. I wouldn't change one thing about it. Nothing. Any chance of running for president? I'd rather set myself on fire than to run for public office again. That's not going to happen, president. No. And secondly, I have never had that disease. You know, I've watched people uh, get that disease. And uh, that's what I used to call it. All the senators seem to have it. Uh, some people have a calling uh, to be president. Others have an ego uh, that calls them to be president. Uh, I've seen both. And America's had plenty of both. Uh, but uh, no, I'm not running for president. Janice wants to know how many grandchildren now? Two. Two little boys. Uh, five and three. Uh, one lives here with uh, his parents on Mark Island. The other lives with his parents. Uh, near Cincinnati, and uh, 
Uh, they're two little, my two little buddies. All I'm really trying to do in life anymore is to be the best grandparent I can be. Lee wants to know, do you have any advice for a young student who wants to make a difference in the world? Uh, get a good education, get a job, get involved in your community, uh, and then see what happens. Real you know, maybe you'll run for office. Maybe you'll, maybe you'll help somebody run for office. Uh, but we need more people in public service who actually know something, who've actually done something, uh, and, and have learned something in life. Bill wants to know very quickly how you feel about modifying or overturning Citizens United. Oh, I don't think it has. It, it has had no impact on the political process. Now, corporations don't spend money on politics. Uh, it, it, it's done nothing. Matter of fact, it, it, if anything, it's helped both parties uh, essentially the same. Uh, the left has made this big thing out of Citizens United. It's a nothing burger. Nothing. Relax. John, it's been a pleasure to talk to you this evening. When you get back to Ohio and you get up in the northern part of the state and you happen to be in Akron, Hudson's not that far. And you got I know. A, a warm welcome here if you want to come by and see the library. We'll, happy, we'll be happy to give you lots of good titles to read. Good. Hey, Gwen, thanks. And to all of you who've uh, paid attention tonight, uh, thanks a million for tuning in. And don't forget, the name of the book is On the House. And congratulations Cheers. on the number one bestseller this evening. Thanks. Thank you, John. And thank you all for attending. John's book is available at the Learned Owl. So we'll hope you go buy it. Good night.